Hello, Andre. Good afternoon. Nice, nice to have you on board. Hello, hello, everyone. Good to be here. Good, good. Gabriel, hello. Dear hey, Lentina. Uh, let me just quickly introduce you, Lentina, so that the audience knows who you are. So, um, Dr. Lentina Pinto holds an electric engineer. Uh, and a master's in computer sciences and a, and a doctorate in applied mathematics. She served as a researcher in CEPEL uh, and was a professor at Copy and Puki uh, Rio. Dr. Pinto founded Ingenio in 1988, where she develops models, tools, general solutions for electric and energy systems and markets, including strategy design, planning, operation, reliability, security, pricing, trading, and risk analysis and management. She authored and co-authored more than 300 technical papers and advised approximately 20 doctors and master's dissertations and thesis. So that's a very impressive curriculum. Thank you very much for being here, Nantina. So the Sorry floor is for up. being so long. <laughs> Sorry for being so long. I, I should have uh, no, started it. So just, just to let you know, you have something around 20 minutes to make a presentation. Sure. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, we know that uh, the green option, uh, it's nice, it's beautiful, everybody wants it, but it does require uh, some sacrifices. What happens is uh, I have to, to know that if I want a green option, uh, it does have costs. Uh, even if uh, I say that uh, um, wind farms are cheaper now, they are, but uh, they just produce during the day, sorry, during the night. And then I have to have other options. And I do have to have other options, let's say if there is no wind or wind is weak or sun is not shining or whatever. So uh, uh, it's uh, more expensive and it, it uh, uh, brings uh, more risks. So I have to balance between uh, emission reduction and a safe and economic supply. And this is uh, what it's all about here. Um, I, if I have a, a mix between thermal and renewable, uh, let's say uh, Brazil is a wonderful place. We have water, we have uh, winds, and uh, we do have bio, sun, and thermal generation. And uh, of course, emissions depend on climatological availability. And worse than that, I know that coal is cheaper than gas. So if I just want a cheap solution, I would go for coal, which is of course not what we want. So uh, just to have a uh, um, way of thinking is uh, if I want something that is more expensive, I don't, I have to know how much it costs and who pays for it. Um, the consumer uh, at this very moment has no signal of emission minimization. So uh, if I just turn on my lights, I don't know if I'm consuming water or wind or thermal or whatever. And uh, I don't know if uh, a, a, a heavier consumption would give me heavier uh, emissions. Maybe not. Maybe the reservoirs are full and everything is okay. Maybe yes. Maybe the reservoirs are empty and uh, this would uh, mean uh, uh, an expensive and polluting thermal generation. So uh, my problem is... Um, Conservation and green energy are not always uh, synonyms. I can just uh, put on my light and I'm not just uh, using some wind that was passing by anyway. Uh, so it depends on thermal dispatch and uh, thermal system. Uh, they may exhibit different emission levels and uh, they depend on specific dispatches and uh, in Brazil, as we have a very interesting and uh, um, customized system, we need specialized solutions. So uh, what I need is to uh, just measure my system and know how to build it, know how to design it. Okay, so uh, let's say uh, we need load reduction for uh, emission reductions. If I need it when, where, and how much. If I want to transfer load from uh, peak power to base load, uh, how, when, and where again. So 
what we need is uh, if I have a smart grid technology, if I have a, a nuclear intelligent system, I have to go to meet my desired objective. This is why it's smart, right? So uh, if I have a city, let's say a system with wind, with uh, electrical vehicles, with sun, with everything, I have to manage it. And I need uh, to search a green operation with a, 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 a smart management. This is why I call it a smart green model. So I uh, will put our brains to towards the smart green and how do we implement it? Uh, we have the concept that is, uh, I have a smart uh, uh, network. I have a green target. Uh, I would target that to emission reduction through demand side management. So I can even say I don't want any remo uh, uh, emissions. That is the path to 100%. And uh, then I have to talk to the consumer. I have to uh, nudge the consumer uh, somehow. And one way of doing this is uh, with bill incentives, with uh, green accounts, uh, even with uh, carbon credits. Uh, so we have to use this intelligence to calculate the signals and uh, induce or reward the consumer to the correct path. Uh, the traditional operation, the models that we have now, and they are uh, uh, in use for decades, uh, they, are, they say, uh, let's minimize the operation at the expected operation costs, uh, subject to uh, electrical grid constraints, uh, equipment uh, limits, uh, load supply, of course, and uh, quality and security constraints, and uh, to uh, uh, deserve the curriculum that was too long, I put some uh, letters here and some mathematical expressions. Um, if I go to the smart green, uh, it's a straightforward uh, extension. I'll have the same constraints, but now what I want is not just expected costs, but a mix between the economical costs and the emission reduction. And I'll have weights to uh, balance both of them. Uh, if I have this model, uh, we have uh, the go green marginal cost. That is, uh, I have a, an emission reduction through load management. Uh, I have my signal that says uh, how much my objective is going to the right path if I change a little my demand, my load. And uh, those uh, marginal uh, costs, uh, the, those are uh, go green. They would identify critical points, incentive uh, evaluation, and assess cost benefits. So uh, uh, what I need is to design uh, a, 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 an incentive system that is uh, an incentive uh, framework for the consumer. Uh, how does it work? Uh, I have uh, the control center and I have the consumer. And what I'm going to do is uh, give them the go green signals saying, look, if you just slow your uh, load a little bit now or in an hour or next night, um, we will uh, give you some, some money or we'll give you a discount on your uh, uh, bill. And the consumer would translate that uh, into actions and as you see, the consumer is not a consumer anymore. Uh, it's a partner. It's a prosumer, as, uh, if you will. But it, it, it's not a, a, a fixed uh, consumption uh, um, that I, I cannot move. So what I want is to empower the consumer with the whole green signals. Uh, and we have smart metering. We have smart networks. We have everything we need for that. Uh, some figures. Uh, we, we made um, we made a simulation in Brazil. that say what happens if a consumer is willing to accept uh, smart green signals. And we took, uh, uh, of course, we have a large hydro-dominated system. Uh, hydroelectric is responsible for, let's say, it's not 90% anymore. It's maybe 80 to 85% of supply. Still, it's a huge uh, uh, share. Um, we have the uh, thermal complementation, we have different plants. 
Um, one thing that is interesting is if I take a look on the thermal cost and emissions, we see that coal has a very low cost and a very high emission. So this is my big problem because if you if you put it on a model, it would get all the coal it can and then uh, split with the others. Um, well, how can I face this? Uh, if you see gas is a, a, a bit is a bit more expensive, but uh, much less uh, polluting. Uh, the pure economic dispatch would give me uh, those marginal costs. I don't know if you can see, but it's around uh, sixty dollars average. By submarket, we have the north, northeastern, southeastern, and south separated. And this is the, uh, the dispatches along the time. Uh, we can see that this is uh, from 20, uh, 2012 to 2016 to 17. We have a very, very uh, long drought, and we had to have a lot of uh, thermal units uh, uh, plugged in. And you can see that coal is the source of the hour. It's, uh, we use everything we can and uh, we complement with gas and diesel. Uh, total cost here should be like $26 billion for the whole period. Uh, but if I say to the consumers, look, I'll, ha I'll, I'll give you the go green, the marginal costs. Um, what happens is uh, if you calculate those marginal costs, let's see if I can change my, okay. Um, we have a, a little marginal costs, in fact, because uh, it's not that much along the time. If I can put it uh, diluted along the time, it's not much. It would be something like a $0.4 uh, per megawatt hour, which is, nothing for the Brazilian costs. And uh, all right, we can have the dispatch now. We can see that we have much less coal, much more gas, some diesel, because uh, we had to complement on those times that uh, we didn't have any more uh, uh, sources to get. But uh, coal is now uh, um, uh, uh, shortened. Uh, the total cost is something like uh, 39 billion, so um, it's it's more, but it's not that much that we cannot afford it. Um, and uh, we had a 20% emission reduction. Of course, it's just an example, just a, a proof of concept, and uh, that would uh, that would be uh, approximately. Uh, 2,000 square kilometers deforestation. So uh, it's a lot. It's not not a, 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 um, uh, something that you cannot take into account. Uh, and you can have the green footprint. Uh, the go green signals can be locational. Uh, they, they can be. Uh, uh, they can bear along the time. You see, they are not that big. Um, for each scenario, we have different costs, which is uh, uh, imaginable. Um, again, load reduction is not uh, uh, emission reduction, they are not synonyms. And uh, if you cannot reduce the load, you can also have a go green alternative, that is, pay for the next clean energy source price. That is, uh, I want to maintain my, my load, then I pay for a new uh, wind farm or a new photovoltaic or whatever. Um, if I do that, uh, prices are a little bit higher, should be, marginal cost should be around uh, 18 to 20, but still manageable. Well, this was, uh, everything was calculated with a dollar of four, so a uh, dollar of six, uh, those figures should be uh, significantly lower. Uh, and the choice, of course, is up to the user. But uh, we can enhance it, we can make uh, the go green, we can make sustainable uh, um, auctions, uh, carbon credits, whatever. 
uh, as conclusions, uh, we can say that uh, if I can't go to the 100%, if I, I want to trail the path to 100%, uh, consumer signals may be realistic and appealing. There is uh, uh, no way I, I'll charge you a hundred dollars per megawatt uh, to be uh, uh, clean. But if I, I, I ask you for 0.5 dollars, everything, everybody would pay. I think uh, a knowledge-based. Uh, you need a knowledge-based uh, framework for load management. Uh, you need uh, correct signals, uh, incentive for reductions, uh, you surcharge for specific needs. Uh, you need risk management, of course. So you, you, you must know how much you are paying for not having the risk of uh, shortage. And uh, this must be translated into regulations and tariffs to be built. And uh, 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 we have to revisit the large Amazonic dams for uh, planning and operation and see how much they are really costing in terms of um, costs, uh, economic costs and uh, emissions and everything. Uh, a green future uh, would say that uh, I can take another look, a green look, and uh, in, uh, uh, make incentives for my load to uh, deliver flexible operation and uh, uh, go into the path to the 100%. And I'm sure that next presentation will say how to manage the load to get it. Thank you for your attention and sorry for the mess of the uh, presentation. Thank you, Lentina. Thank you for keeping track of time, perfect timing. I'm um, just going to move on to Gabriel Cavados. He's graduated in mechanical engineering from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, holds a master's degree in energy planning from Copy UFRJ. He's a project management at Batsila with over 10 years of experience in the Brazilian electricity sector with emphasis on market de development and flexible generation projects. Thank you, Gabriel. We'll have a uh, 20 minutes presentation and then we'll have time for some questions and discussions. Thank you. Close is yours. Very good. Very good, Andrea. Thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to share the panel with Leontina and yourself. I guess it's the first time, and I am very used to be the the attendee of your panels. So for me, it's a real pleasure to participate together with you here to talk about flexibility, right? So I I I I I, I, I explain to everybody when I talk to my five-year-old daughter what is flexibility, and she always always says to me. Dad, my ballet teacher says that we need to be flexible, and that's the perfect uh, 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 meaning of flexibility, right? So here to talk with you about what is flexibility for power grids, I divided the presentation into two stages. So first of all, talking about the great transition that we are experiencing and how we are only in the beginning. Uh, by the end of this first part, I will bring what is flexibility for 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 power generation, and it's not that different from what it is for the ballet students. Uh, on the second part, I will show to the audience and to you uh, a study that we as Varsila did uh, a, a few weeks ago, a few months ago, showing how, how Brazil needs to expand its system flexibility in order to deal with a lot of power that's coming and will require this, this attribute from, from the grid. So if I am to move forward, uh, I guess this is the question, right? Is our society in a path to 100 renewable system? And, and everybody is talking about that. You saw, you just saw Leontina's presentation. The, the answer is yes, but there is a but, right? We are way in the beginning. And I would say that 100% renewable system is still a far away dream. Uh, I, I took some graphs from the Bloomberg Energy, New Energy Finance uh, from last week. Uh, he, here you can see how, how the trend is moving, right? So on the graph on the left, we have global installed capacity. And, and on the graph on the right, you have the share of the generation itself. We can see that renewables are already penetrating. 
uh, into the grids. So we can see coal and natural gas kind of stationary, natural gas growing a little bit, but we can start to see um, much more of yellow, dark blue and blue, which are sun, wind and hydro. Uh, the same thing is happening to the to the generation itself. When when you stall wind and solar, you must keep them running because sun is for free, wind is for free. So if you want to take maximum advantage of installing wind and solar, you must maximize their generation and, and put them to participate in the grid uh, together when they are available. So we, we must take that energy when they are available. Uh, if we are to expand a little bit here, uh, how this trend is moving forward, basically what is driving this trend is the new energy. So when, when a country country's economy grows, uh, its demand for energy grows together with it, and this new energy required to, to, to meet the growth is being supplied basically by renewables and basically by wind and solar. That's what the graph on the left is showing to us. So fossil fuels, mainly coal and natural gas, are declining in participation uh, for, for the new energy. The, the, the same thing, uh, uh, but in numbers now, it's on the graph on the right. This, this shows the capacity change over time, the net capacity change over time, meaning what is being installed as new minus what is being decommissioned over time. And we can see, again, a lot of yellow, a lot of dark blue, and a lot of uh, light blue. So uh, are, are we living in a transition? I guess so, yes. Uh, probably still in the beginning, but this is something that we, we, we must pay attention because uh, last year, if we take into consideration the major players around the world, excluding, of course, China, because that's a different animal, most of the countries developed and emerging are installing renewables into their grid. So the graph, the map is showing which was the source that was most installed in each country last year. If we take the same map from 10 years ago, it was all gray and dark gray, uh, with exceptions from Brazil, for example, where, where hydro was historically always the, 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 the queen of the, of the systems. Uh, moving forward, so the, the transition has started way in the beginning, but if we have to dream with a society basically living with renewable energy, what, what, what was that looking like, right? Uh, I would say that sun will drive the society. S uh, solar power has the potential to, to provide energy for, for our society together with wind and other renewables, even thermal with, with uh, uh, synthetic fuels, renewable fuels, they play an important role, but, but solar is the new king of the power kingdom. If we have to accomplish the, the, the path to 100% uh, renewable systems, we ex should expect sun to play an important role. And, and, and let's close our eyes here a little bit and, and imagine to 2050. 2050 is just, just an example. It can be 2060, 2070, it doesn't matter, right? It's just a number on the screen. But if we are the authorities of a country, what should we expect from a grid? from electricity supply, we expect to be reliable, sustainable, and affordable. Everybody should be able to pay for it. It should be green and it should not fail. It should be reliable. It should work 24 seven. And what is the problem when we insert a lot of wind and solar into the grid? Let's see. The two graphs on, on, on the left are from the wind power generation on the northeast region of Brazil. The problem with wind is because it varies too much. We cannot predict when it's going to happen. And the system must be prepared to take that energy whenever it's available. So we have volatility. We have this word here called stochasticity, which means unpredictability. Uh, and we have this zero marginal cost characteristic, meaning uh, we should not waste it. Whenever they are available, we should take it. 
the systems were not prepared to deal with this kind of characteristic. The, the, I, 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 will, I will call the, the operational problem kind of boring nowadays, and it's getting interesting because uh, the more wind you have in the grid, the less hair will remain in the head of the operator because the guy will have to check every minute if the balance between generation and demand is being met. And we need we as a as a planner of the system we need to prepare the system to this new feature that will be required the system must be able to meet generation and demand at all times and there is a special feature called flexibility that i will explain a little bit later but this is the the characteristics about wind sun is better of course uh because sun we know that we will have sun at least during a few hours in a day if we don't have any sun during the day mankind has another another problem to to deal with and it's a much bigger problem than power generation so sun sun is better than wind in that sense it's a little bit more more uh, predictable we, we we know when we will have sun the problem with sun is that it is concentrated with uh, uh, uh some portion of the day so you must balance when you contract sun with other source because sun is not available during the night of course again if we put a lot of sun into the grid you must have your system prepared to deal and to generate power during the times where the sun is not available and we should prepare the system to deal with these high and low ramps that are showing to the graph when when sun is rising the ramp up is quite fast and when the sun puts itself the the, the ramp down is also very steep so the system must be prepared to deal with this type of characteristics. And that's what we mean by system flexibility. If you think about it, it's kind of the same thing that my daughter says about ballet. You, you must be able to stretch yourself and, and, and do very hard mov movements that are required. But when we talk about power system, flexibility is the system's ability to deal with quick variations in the demand and in the generation and by quick variations we are talking about here on minute on hourly level because wind and sun brings this new feature into the power grids and the power grid must be able to deal with it the power grids of the past they were not built to do that because wind and solar simply didn't exist and now that they exist and they will enter heavily into the power markets because they are cheap, we must prepare the grid to deal with such uh, problems. There are quite a few uh, technologies and solutions that can, can help the planner and the, 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 the operation authority of the system to deal with this new characteristic, right? So we, we, we can, for example, balance, when we contract new energy to the grids, we can, we can balance solar and wind we know that solar we have during the day wind majority we get during the night and if we balance wind and solar we, we reduce the need for the system uh, uh flexibility right we we are being smart here just balancing the system with new energy uh if if i have a system highly interconnected that helps as well because i can transfer huge amounts of energy from one region to another and and and, and help and help the operator to to balance the grid we have storage and by storage it's not only the battery storage that is famous nowadays it's also the hydro storage it's a great flexible asset and brazil is lucky to have that uh flexible uh, uh storage is is one of the keys i don't know if brazil will be able to use it because the hydro plants in brazil are contracted to do something else are not paid to provide that service to the grid this is something that we need to discuss but storage is a great flexible asset the hydro storage is perfect but also battery storage can be used especially in applications when we have short periods of time for example one hour two hours if you go for long storage it starts to become prohibitive the cost starts to become prohibitive another another uh, great flexibility uh, asset and i will say great because i work for it it's flexible generation you install a lot of thermal power plants running on natural gas and you install them expecting not to use them. They are installed just to back up the system uh, when you don't have wind or sun or water. 
uh, that's perfect. If everything goes according to your plan, that's that's the insurance cost that the system is carrying out. But in case something happens and you don't have renewable resources, you can dispatch uh, power plants. And it's most important for them to have this fast start and dynamic uh, uh, capabilities because the requirement will be shorter and shorter the more wind and the more solar we have in the grid. Uh, demand side management is also a flexible resource. Uh, uh, as far as we go with smart grids and the ability for the consumer to turn off uh, its, its, its consumption during the day as per the grid requirement and get money out of it, if we are able to do that, it's probably the cheapest way, but also very limited uh, capacity because we cannot turn off 13 gigawatts, for example, of power from a grid instantaneously. So it's, it's it's important but has limited reach. Uh, if I have to take away this first part of the presentation, I, 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 if you understood that we are in a big transition towards wind and solar, towards renewables, uh, uh, that these renewables, they bring together with them some challenges that we need to address nowadays. They may not be important today because we saw in the first graph there that, that the share of renewables is still very, very, very small uh, in the world, but they tend to grow really, really fast. Uh, we need to start talking about how to make our grid more flexible uh, in order to accommodate as friendly as possible this large amount of, of renewables. Uh, as, as a side takeaway here, uh, if I am talking about to increase flexibility into the grid, this means that inflexible sources, they don't match with renewables. So we, we will see naturally as more wind and solar penetrates into the grids, we will see less and less inflexible plants, less and less coal less and less combined cycle gas, natural gas. I'm not saying that they are dead, but uh, over time, their importance into the grids will be lower and lower the more renewables are penetrating. Uh, I, I include here nuclear energy as well, because nuclear is inflexible. You cannot turn on and turn off, it's simply uh, technology speaking. So I, I put it here, but I understand that nuclear is, is more uh, politics than, than technicalities, but the more renewables you have, into your grid, it will become more and more difficult for you to accommodate nuclear as well. It, it, it simply doesn't match with the new requirement of the grid. Now let's jump to, to the fun part, and I will spend maybe six to seven minutes uh, on the exercise that we did for Brazil. And, and for those that like to watch the Mythbusters, uh, the, the, the intention of this study was to, to, to end with a myth that the Brazilian grid can deal with this type of characteristics from wind and solar because we have the hydro storage. This is true in part, but, but I will show you the results. Everybody knows that Brazil is a major renewable country. I will not spend much time on this slide. A lot of hydro, a lot of sugarcane biomass, and we will have a lot of small hydro, wind and solar moving forward. That's what the graph on the right shows to us. The participation of hydro will, will go down simply because we will have problems permitting new hydro. Uh, also the cost of the renewables, they are so cheap that it, it, it becomes a no brainer to install them into the system. We see that EPI, our planning officer in Brazil already recognizes the need of what they call alternativa para ponta, which means a picking alternative for the grid, which is another name for flexibility. So we, we, we took the exercise that we did is that we, we took the data from, from Apple. We had our model to simulate the what, what would be the optimal expansion of the Brazilian grid until 2027, and how that system in 2027 would behave given uh, certain, certain types of technology. Not spending too much time, there will be a white paper that Varsila uh, will publish regarding these and, and, and the results, more detailed results you, you will be able to find there. But when we run the long-term expansion of, 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 of Brazil using the same premises, that are available for from the authorities. We come up with similar results. So EPE finds 12 gigawatts of new flexibility needs. We found 13 gigawatts. So this 
this is very good because we we are using different approaches different models but the results are the same so we are we are confirming that brazil needs to increase flexibility we will see why uh, even even though we have a lot of hydro and what we did is we 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 took these results from the long term in 2027 and we simulate these 13 gigawatts of flexibility with a lot of flexible technologies right so we took we took these 13 gigawatts and we simulate some scenarios including uh, no flexibility internal combustion engines uh, uh, gas turbines battery storage and pub storage and say how 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 would be how the system would behave with these technologies and 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 which one is is the perfect fit for for the country and why right so moving forward these are the preliminary results uh i don't know if you can see very well but the graph from the left to the right we can see the first graph shows the total cost of the system and we can see that the scenario the three scenarios with flexible generation, including engines and turbines, they provide the lowest cost, mainly because they, they avoid unserved energy, they avoid blackouts. If you don't put flexibility on your grid, there is a high chance of you getting blackouts, especially during dry years. I am showing you here the results of the average scenario. So we simulated dry years, average scenarios, and 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 wet years, and the results shown here are the average of these all scenarios together. Uh, uh, this first graph shows that flexible generation may have an important role for Brazil to integrate renewables. Uh, we can see in the second graph that they avoid unserved energy, and this is a big portion of the cost because when you have blackouts, you must monetize that black house as per the cost of deficit. So this is a, a, an important thing as well. And you you can avoid emissions as well so it's 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 a kind of a nonsense but believe me when you add flexibility to your grid you make the portfolio already existing better so you 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 don't dispatch for example an existing gas turbine plant out of their uh, optimum path so you you can by only installing flexibility you can make your portfolio of generation works better just as a final slide, Andrea, you don't need to, to, to tell me because I know that I am already uh, uh, out of time. This is this is the the just to show to you how 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 it's getting used, so how the flexibility is getting used. So the the orange portion of the graph here is is flexibility. So what we did here, this graph shows one week of demand. So you can see uh, demand floating during the day and during the night. So this is one week of the month of October 2027, because October is the month where the level of the reservoirs are very low and the wind is generation is very high. So that's when the, the grid gets really challenged in terms of, of electricity supply. So if we have water in the dams, you can see that the hydro plants can deal with the intermittency quite quite full. The dispatch of, of, of the flexibility of the flexible plants is, is very low. If we have the average year, it's the same. But the problem is, if we have a dry year, then it becomes to, starts to become challenging to operate and your flexible asset is needed to the energy requirement, not only for the picking purpose, but also for the energy requirement. And this is simply because the flexibility of the hydro plants, they are limited by and they and they they vary pretty much proportional to the level of the dams. If you don't have water in the dams, there is very little flexibility coming from hydro. Uh, just just a hint, uh, uh, I, I will not spend much time, the, the, the material will be available on the white paper. It becomes very important, the number of starts and stops of, of power plants in the system. So if you have a lot of wind and solar, you, you must have uh, 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 technologies that are able to turn on and turn off, not only fast, but multiple times, because this is a heavy cost of the system. To sum up, I will not say all of these again. Just to to highlight some some suggestions for Brazil, we just saw that even though we have a friendly environment for renewables, we need to have uh, flexible generation on board because 
in case we don't have water, it becomes really, really important. Uh, the, this flexibility is not only serving the peaking uh, of, of, of the wind and solar, it becomes important to serve energy when we don't have water uh, uh, from, from the hydro. So it has two applications. And that means that not only we have to be dynamic, but efficiency of the, of the technology, the cost of generation becomes important, especially during these dry years. Uh, flexibility must be procured on system level. On our view, because only only by adding them, I can uh, the, the flexibility can can optimize the, the the portfolio of the system. So there are advantages on system level, not only on not only on the cost of the source itself. Uh, it's important to consider this amount of starts and stops, because we don't know when the disruption will be steeper and as more wind. And as more solar comes to the grid, you will have more dynamic requirements. You will have more starts and stop. And this must be part of the equation right now. Andrea, these are my my slides. I think we are we are good. Thank you, Gabriel. Um, you were pretty much on time as well. Thank you very much for that. Um, so uh, I think that was a very good. Um, combination of presentations because Leontina had a good perspective on the demand side and you gave a good perspective on the supply side. So we should get, be getting some questions, written questions um, through the uh, chat right now. Uh, I have uh, one question here already uh, for Leontina. Uh, the first uh, congratulates for the pre excellent presentation and then asks, what do you think about implementing a carbon tax in the dispatch in order to incorporate environmental externalities, supposedly a value between 15 and $80 per ton of CO2? I'm sorry, uh, I, I didn't hear uh, the question well. To implement what? I'm going to read it again. So uh, right. she first congratulates on the presentation and Thank then you. asks, what do you think about implementing a carbon tax in the dispatch in order to incorporate environmental externalities? Uh, it, it's um, uh, it, it's very uh, similar to our proposal, but what we do is um, uh, we get economical and uh, uh, inv environmental uh, signals. So uh, it's not a fixed thing or a guessing thing, but it, it's done all the time with the signals. So I think it's good, but uh, uh, it should be um, driven not by guessing, but by, by uh, uh, conceptual uh, uh, signals. I don't know if I, I answered the question. Um, well, it answered it to me. Um, so I don't know. Uh, can I answer again if there was any clarifications that uh, the person needs? Uh, there, there are any more questions here in the uh, in the uh, panel. But uh, as people think, uh, I think we can have some discussions. I have a few questions myself. I have actually a, a ton of technical curiosities uh, with uh, Leontina's model and with Gabrielle's uh, exercise, but I'm going to skip all of those. Uh, maybe we can talk about that another time. Um, so uh, just for Leontina, I, I found it was very interesting to that your model is pretty much focused on on, on demand side management and uh, the, the the signals to for consumers to actually uh, introduce that. Um, given uh, just trying to make the link to what Gabriel was saying about uh, renewable energy generation, specifically uh, on-site generation, distributed generation. Does the model actually allow you to see the interface between demand-side management and on-site electricity production in, 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 in uh, distributed generation? And how does that uh, turn out in the uh, results? Oh, it it it, uh, it really does. It uh, points the path because you see, uh, if I can take the value of uh, the renewable option and say, okay, I can uh, I can look at the network uh, on a granularity that um, allows me to see the distributed points, 
And I can say, look, on that point, if you put something, it would uh, uh, save me um, this and this and this. So you can balance the cost of the uh, DG and uh, uh, the benefits. So it's almost a, a driver to see where to put it and uh, the cost benefit of uh, each one. How it pays for uh, itself. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, just uh, um, I I've seen uh, your lectures before, so I have a question also that how does that relate to policy institutional framework that we currently have in Brazil? Because uh, we do have the uh, <laughs> net metering yes. uh, uh, <laughs> system, yeah. and how what do we need in terms of legal framework to to accelerate the the path to one hundred percent? Very little, in fact, because what we're doing is using the existing models, so you don't have to change anything. All you have to do is make a small change on the objective function. Uh, so mathematically, it's uh, it's just straightforward. If you think about uh, regulations, all there is the modernization of the sector. There, there are lots of discussions, but it's a discussion without a, a, um, a mathematical basis, or it doesn't even have to be a mathematical basis, but an economical basis for it. So we like renewables. Right, but uh, how much does it cost, how to implement, and, and what what are the signals, and what are the cost benefits, and so on. So uh, it's something that uh, you have to uh, evaluate for an offer to the society or the government or both, of course, to make a decision. So what we're uh, uh, proposing here is uh, offering uh, information to get the correct decision not to decide, but to offer the information. Because you see, uh, I don't like uh, 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 huge dams. Why not? Uh, uh, maybe if you don't put the dams, you, you, you use uh, diesel. So will you use diesel? Do you need diesel? And um, ca can I uh, mitigate climatological risk with renewables like water and sun or water and, and, and uh, wind and so on? Can we? Did we evaluate it? Did you simulate it? So I think it it, it uses the correct the, the uh, actual framework. I have restrictions for them, but uh, anyway, you can use them, and you can advance. This is. Uh, uh, what we're proposing, not a breakup, but uh, a, a step forward. I hope it was clear. Yeah, yes, I, 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 it was pretty clear. Thank you. Um, so I just thought, people, I, I know that everyone is uh, probably it's the end of the the uh, the uh, webinar, so everyone's uh, a bit shy of asking questions. So I have a bunch of questions myself. So if no one actually uh, adds questions to the chat here, I'll just keep on asking if that's okay with the two panelists. So, uh, um, Andrea, Andrea, Andrea there, are, there are some questions in, in the chat from Amaru and from Aniela, I guess. It's not it's not showing up to me. It's not it's not on my. Really? Yeah. On the chat. It's not, it's, are you are you on the questions on the questions uh, yeah. uh, item or on the chat? Look, look on the chat. Look on the chat. There, oh. is, there is one item chat there. There you go. Questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but I was told that the question would come in the uh, in the uh, questions part, not the uh, great. So questions. Amaro has a question to Gabriel. <laughs> Can synthetic oil help to achieve 100% renewable? Yes, uh, synthetic fuels in general, not only oil but gas and hydrogen, they 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 will become an important port. When we talk about probably 2050, right? Because uh, as of today, the costs are still a little bit prohibitive, but we are we're not that far away. But we we foresee renewables uh, fuels replacing natural gas after the natural gas takes care of of this transition. Barcelona has started the development of a hydrogen engine, so that's that's what we see as well as a company. Thank you, Gabriel. There's another question for you from um, Aniela Descalzi. So thanks for the presentation. When we talk about flexibility, we talk about all, mar all market segments, generation competitive. 
response to demand, competitive, question mark, uh, and transmission that is a monopoly. In this sense, planning becomes complicated because generation is a competitive market and not planned many times. How is it possible to plan a flexible and safe operation in the long term, considering technological neutrality in the competitive generation market? Yeah, uh, uh, this is this is a, a, a nice and, 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 and very complicated question to answer. Uh, I, I showed in the slides that there, there are several assets that can be can be installed in a grid in order to, to make it more flexible, more friendly to renewables. Of course, uh, there, there are some things that you, you can do when you contract energy. So if you have a free market for energy, you must give the correct signs for, for that market to price correctly the energy generated at the time of the demand. So for example, uh, uh, when, when most of the world nowadays do to compare energy sources is the LCOE, right? LCOE, the levelized cost of, of energy. Th that is okay in the past, but now as we need to meet generation and the money, the shorter period of times, there must be a signal to say, hey, this source is generated when by the time that the system needs and this is not because we we may end it up with with that situation where wind is more competitive than solar but solar happens during the times of the day where the demand is there and, and wind may may go during the night so on the competitive markets for energy there are upgrades that you need to do in order to price correct the value of the energy it's not the price of the energy it must be the value of the energy is this enough? No. So on, on, on planning, on system planning level, you need to plan transmission resources as well uh, on an optimal way in order to, to reduce the need of the system flexibility. This can be done. But flexibility, flexible assets build up only to deal with the, the short-term variation of renewables, uh, in my view, must be done on central level, on, app, on for example, on EPIS level, on the regulator level, because you, I mean, the, the benefit of the flexible asset is on the system level. So I, I, I don't see a way nowadays to give to the, for example, market participants a correct sign for them to build flexible assets for, for that. So I, in my view, flexibility, as we are talking here, must be uh, 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 studied uh, and, and procured by an authority on system level because it's where all the benefits and risks are being seen. And, Luciano, posso claro, complementar um segundo? Claro. É, uh, sorry, sorry, it's in English. Uh, uh, if I may complement, uh, these signals are exactly what uh, we, we, we uh, uh, showed in our presentation. So they are the correct signals for each hour or for each scenario or for each plant or for each whatever. So uh, they can. Uh, the point is uh, to know, so signals are easily calculated. This is not a problem. Uh, problem is to know if EPE or the planning uh, arm of the uh, Ministry of uh, Mines and Energy, if they are uh, uh, willing to follow it. Because uh, you made what, what we see is we, we, you see a, a wonderful EPE planning, and then they made an option, and everything is spoiled. So, uh, 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 point is not having the technical resources for it. It's a solved problem. It's okay. Uh, problem is political, and see if. Um, our institutions uh, will be willing to use the tools that we have. Fully, fully agree. Fully agree, Leon. Yeah, thanks. A real point. Um, so we have one minute left. So um, in case there are any other questions, I think that I would just like to close here the session. Um, Nothing coming through the chat or the questions. So I would like to thank you very much, Leontina and Gabriel, for the thank excellent you. presentations. It was they were very good. Um, and thank you, the organizers, for this lovely webinar. It was very uh, informative. And uh, thank you very much for the audience. Um, I don't know if you, the panelists, Gabriel and Leontina, would like to say any last words. If not, mm -hmm. we can just uh, wrap up and and um, and I'll.
just to say that I am very happy to share the panel with the, you two. It was really a pleasure for me. Thank you. Thank you. A pleasure. Bye-bye, guys. Thank you, all of you.